Fantastic. So welcome. I am really happy that everyone is here. Um, who knows about our summer reading program? Okay, three people. Everyone's going to know about our summer reading program. It's really exciting. It's not just for children. Um, you get rewarded as well. Um, super easy. You can, you can participate in two ways to sign up. You can either do it online. Everything is online. I do have information. Okay, I will bring down some flyers if you want to do it online. So you could just take there. it home and join online. Now, or you can do good old fashioned pen and paper. How does it work? I'm not going to give you any list on what to read. I want to reward you for what you want to read in children's books. Um, very easy. You read a book, I give you a raffle ticket. I give you up to three a week. If you want to read six books, that's great, but I'm still only giving you three raffles per week. Today, woohoo, you get a raffle for being here. What? But you can't claim it if you're not signed up. Um, so you get up to four raffles a week and you have fantastic prizes upstairs. You can enter your raffle for a few different things. Um, we have a wine basket. We have a Annie's lunch gift card. We have a Cactus Jack's gift basket and dinner gift card. We have a self-care kit and an outdoor dining kit. And the grand prize is $100 to the local. Okay. Yes, I think that's fantastic. Already so why not get rewarded for coming to programs? And that counts if you do it virtually as well. So if you are listening... And if you are participating here and need your code, it is B-E-E-Z, like zebra, B. So if you're participating online, it's going to ask you, what is the secret password? Now you have it. Um, as I said, I will run upstairs. I will get you all the information you know. And without further ado, um, welcome to the birds and the bees and how to uh, support them in your garden. This is Henry Holmeyer. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're very happy to have him. He is a longtime gardener, um, an organic gardener, which is actually quite lovely, not harming our world. I love it. Um, and an author of four gardening books. And I bet somewhere that you've been on the radio as well, correct? Which is uh, quite the accolade over there. So um, I know you're going to come here and listen to me, so I'll let uh, the experts speak. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Maria, for inviting me here. And thanks to the Guilford Library. I love to get together with people and, and talk about gardening and, and share some of my slides of interesting plants and, and talk about what you can do in your own in your own home to, in this case, support the bees, support the pollinators, support the birds. And in the last few years, I've become very interested in growing mostly native plants. That is plants that grow naturally here that are not from China or Japan or from Europe. Um, and there's a reason for that. One of the things is that I read a book by Doug Tallamy. He's a, a PhD entomologist, a bug guy. And um, he explains in the book that to get a, a clutch of chickadees from hatching, to fledging, which is 16 days, the mother and father a chickadee needs between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars to feed those babies. It's just an incomprehensible number of caterpillars. And those caterpillars mainly feed on our native trees, oaks, cherries, poplars, um, even elm trees. Um, and of course, you know, the, the great majestic elms of New England Main Street are long gone, but uh, you'll see that the, uh, the elm trees are still growing out there. They only live to be about 30 years, and then they die of the Dutch elm disease. But it gave me a new perspective on, on elms. I used to just consider them junk because I knew they couldn't grow to maturity. But at any rate, I, I, it was a very um, interesting to me that the native plants are the ones that do best for supporting our birds um, because of the caterpillars. And those caterpillars are one life form of butterflies and moths. So they're on the way to becoming the monarch butterfly. And I grew up with monarch butterflies. There were plenty of them. Nowadays, they're few and far between. And again, that was sort of a wake up call. 
when I read Doug Tallamy's book, I found out there are lots of different species of moths and butterflies that are in danger. It's not just the monarch. The monarch is the poster boy and the poster girl of, of butterflies, but there are plenty of other ones that are also in danger. There are birds that are in danger. And if each one of us grows things um, in our yard, we can help support our monarch butterflies, those other unnamed butterflies that we don't know their, their names and plenty of our, our birds. So let's look at some of those plants. Um, before I go on though, actually I'd like to just say, I live in Cornish Flat, New Hampshire. That's about 70 miles from here. And um, if I didn't have to drive through Tilton again, ever, I'd be happy. <laughs> Um, I, I've been gardening all my life. I started with my grampy back when I was two or three years old. I'm now 75, so I've been doing it a long time. Thank you. Um, I did bring some books uh, over there. It's uh, available for sale and, and signing after the, uh, after the talk. It's $17, which is a discount from what it would cost you if I had to mail it to you. Um, but let's start looking at some things that, that I grow and uh, you can grow too. Coming over here today, I noticed elderberries growing by the side of the road. They like a moist environment. Here on the left, you can see the, the, the flowers which are blooming right now and on the right, the berries. I do eat the berries. I plant the, these bushes, but um, they also grow wild around me. It, they like a moist area along the rivers, but they'll grow pretty much anywhere. Uh, grapes of all kinds are great for birds. It's one of, they, they use the, uh, the twigs for making nests. They love the berries, the, the grapes. All kinds of cherries are great for feeding the, the uh, caterpillars of butterflies, butterflies and moths. There you see pin cherry with the, uh, the cherries on the left and the blossoms on the right. The black cherry is another one. I have a big black cherry next to my house that's about 60 feet tall and has a base that's as, that I couldn't get my arms around. I bought my house 51 years ago and um, it was a big tree then, it's even bigger now. There's the blossom. White pine is a very important tree uh, for birds of all types. Uh, whoops, let me go backwards here. There we go. Um, birds need not only food, they need places to get out of the wind in winter. And of course, all your evergreens are good for that. Uh, birds need protection from cats and a, a big tall tree is a good place to hang out. So, uh, the pine is, is um, a tree that you probably know and a good one for the landscape. The Canadian hemlock, likewise, it produces little tiny pine cones that uh, birds will uh, feed on. It's a great place to stay out of the wind in wintertime. Brambles of all sorts, even the wild ones that don't produce berries that you wanna make into a pie, are important to birds. Here's one of my favorites, winterberry. Uh, this one grows in wet places. How many of you have seen these berries? Yes, they stand out in winter and oftentimes you see them for sale at a florist shop or a grocery store. Uh, yeah, they, they need both male and female plants. You can't buy one winterberry and expect to get uh, berries. Usually what, uh, when you go to a, a garden center or a nursery, they'll, they'll have lots of different cultivars or types of the females and then just one male. And if, for example, last uh, fall, I planted some near my stream, they like it wet, and I planted four females and one male. He's going to have a good time. <laughs> uh, poison ivy is actually very good for birds though I don't recommend planting it. <laughs> uh, particularly migrating birds, when they see those, they, the, the leaves turn red in the fall and, and they, uh, 
ornithologists call them foliar fruit flags, leaf fruit flags. The, the bird up in the air can see that red and they'll know that they're probably gonna get some berries down there. Sumac is another. Sumac is a, is a plant that we don't tend to want on our property because it sends out roots and it pops up all over the place. It's most commonly seen alongside the road in sandy areas, full sun. But in the springtime, when the robins come back, they love to eat the sumac berries because it's the only thing that's around. The silly robins come back before the earthworms uh, are out and about and they're hungry and the sumac berries um, are good for them and for blue jays and other things. But uh, the reason the birds don't eat them off earlier is very simple. Birds love fatty products. So um, the, the outer skin of a blueberry has oils or fats in it, as do many of the other uh, berries that they really like to eat. Whereas sumac is sort of dry and fluffy. If you ever looked at it, it doesn't seem like there's much there. So it, they really just have some sugars. But what they're really looking for is something like a pepperoni pizza. That's what they like best because it's got plenty of fat. Um, but they're, they're very useful when it comes to early spring. Here's another uh, plant that I love. In the winter on the left, you can see the, the form of that. On the right, this is at my house, you can see the white blossoms. And here's a close up of the berries. Um, I took that picture on August 15th a few years ago. It's a very rich berry with lots of fats in, its, in the skin. So uh, it grows wild for me. D does anybody here know it? Does it in this part of the state, do you see the pagoda dog? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a native. According to Doug Tallamy, that uh, entomologist I was talking about earlier, the most important tree uh, for pollinators and birds is the oak. All oaks are terrific. And it goes back to the fact that the, the butterflies and moths co-evolve with the oaks. When I was a kid, I did not like Brussels sprouts or kale, lots of things that I love and eat now. Well, go back 10,000 years perhaps, and oaks were probably not being eaten very much by the butterflies and moths of the day. But because they were all together around at the same time, eventually the butterflies and moths learned to eat oak leaves and not mind the fact that there are tannins there and bitter compounds. So now butterflies and moths, because they've been in the same native area for so long, feed on oaks. And, you know, going back to that whole thing of how many caterpillars does a, a clutch of chickadees eat? It's just amazing um, how many there are. And you have to have some of the same plants that feed those caterpillars. And the oaks are really at the top of the list. Apples and crab apples. Um, are, are good for the pollinators. The bees and other insects uh, are attracted to them. Apples are actually not native. They come from Russia. Uh, they were imported to the United States when, with the, with the uh, pilgrims long ago. But if you go by an apple tree when it's in bloom, you'll just hear the buzz of the, of the bees in it. Alders are mostly considered sort of junky trees that grow in swampy areas and alongside streams. Um, but they're actually very good for uh, pollinators. And it's actually a nitrogen fixing plant, just like clover and some of your legumes, your beans and, and peas will fix nitrogen from the air into the soil. Alders do the same thing. One of my favorite early spring uh, plants is the shad bush or service berry. And um, it blooms in May for me in Cornish Flat. On the right, you see a close up of the, of the blossoms. When you're driving down the road in May and you see a burst of white in a small tree on the side of the road, you'll probably assume it's a wild apple tree, but it's not. 
Most of those are shad bush or service berry. And they make blueberries, um, which are very tasty. I've grown the shad bush for 30 years or so, but I never got any berries because the birds love them so much. And they'll pick them a few days before I would. But I was, I was working on a job someplace in a shady area and they had some, some service berries and the birds hadn't gotten there. So I tried them and they were almost as good as blueberries. The red osier dogwood uh, has nice red stems. The trick on this one, um, if you want those red stems is to cut some of them back every year, right to the ground. Maybe a third of the stems, if you, if you prune them out, the new stems are the ones that have the color, the bright red in winter. They also come in a yellow and they have flowers and fruit. Your viburnums of all kinds are very attractive, make berries that are very attractive to birds. Unfortunately, there is a viburnum leaf beetle, which has become a real problem in Vermont, and I hope it doesn't come here, but it's, it's, it's west of us. I don't know, do you have trouble with viburnums and, and leaf beetles? Nobody seems to be nodding their head, so we're lucky, I think, still. Here's another one I like, hobblebush, which is a viburnum. Uh, when you're driving down the road, it almost looks like a, a fancy dogwood, the kind they have in Massachusetts and Connecticut and so forth when they're blooming. They're nice bright white flowers. Birches of all sorts are good for uh, both the, the butterflies, moths, and, and birds. There's your white birch, which is just so distinctive in any season. Blueberries, you know, People spend lots of money buying bird seed and putting up bird feeders all winter long. And then they have blueberries and they cover them up with, with a mesh and say, those berries are not gonna, I'm not gonna let the birds get at those. Well, my philosophy is plant a few more bushes so you can share. Because what I, I got discouraged when I found that birds would get into the netting and die. If I didn't check them, you know, twice a day, then, you know, you go away for the weekend, you come back and you find a dead robin in there. It's just very discouraging. So I don't net my blueberries anymore. The other trick that you need to know is that if you want a lot of berries, you've got to have very acidic soil. And that means adding uh, garden sulfur or a fertilizer like holly tone or holly grow that add acid to the soil. You need a pH of about 5.5, which is very acidic. You'll have nice looking bushes if the soil is near neutral, but you won't get the berries. Yeah, that helps. It does help, but you know what? I think the best thing to do is go down to the hardware store and get one of these little pH testing kits. It costs you between five and $10. Test your soil, see what the pH is. And if it's six or above, get a, a, a three pound bag of sulfur, sprinkle the sulfur around each bush, maybe. Well, you could read the directions, but my guess is probably a cup of agricultural sulfur sprinkled around a bush would bring the pH down. It takes time because sulfur does, agricultural sulfur does not dissolve in the water the way sugar or salt does. It'll sit there on the surface has little yellow bits of sulfur for quite a while. So uh, get some of that or an acidic fertilizer that they make for hollies and rhododendrons and so forth and put some around and you'll be amazed at how many more blueberries you get. When is the time to do that? Do it now. Okay. Yeah. Um, you don't wanna add fertilizer in the fall because that'll say, if you put it down in September, it would encourage new growth and that new growth is gonna get, could be damaged by a cold winter. So June is a good month, July is fine. I wouldn't do it after August if you're adding a fertilizer. If you're putting on sulfur, you can do it anytime. Oh, okay. All right, I'll write it down. Good question. Um, Pruning is important. Uh, let me see if I have a picture in this slideshow. I know I do somewhere. No, I don't. Um, 
the, the fruit buds right now are round and about the size of a small green pea, okay? Uh, leaf buds, and actually in the winter time is when you're, when you're looking at the leaf buds, they're, sm they're, they're smaller and pointy. You wanna prune in the winter generally um, when there are no leaves on, but you look, if you see lots of little pointy bulb uh, buds, those are all gonna just make leaves. The round fat ones mean that they're gonna flower and they'll have a number of flowers and leaves on one bud. So look at your bush carefully. And if you see branches without any fruit buds, you can prune those back a bit. But pruning is overrated for blueberries. You want your blueberry bushes to get bigger because they're gonna have more berries. Um, so that's, they're not so, they're not a fast growing plant. Uh, you know, it can take, a, a, if you buy something in a, in a pot this size, you know, here, this is a little blueberry. It's gonna take five years before you have something that's big enough to actually put on your breakfast cereal. Yeah. So um, don't do a lot of pruning early on. If you see a branch that's been damaged by heavy snow, cut it off. If you see a branch that is crashing into another branch or mm -hmm. rubbing against another branch, cut one of them off. Mm -hmm. Just use common sense and don't, don't do too much pruning. But they're great. They have nice blossoms in June. They have beautiful red leaves in the fall. You can use blueberries, not just in a blueberry patch. You can plant them as an attractive shrub. Uh, memory uh, from a database that will remember past passwords? Well, no, they'll blossom plenty, but they don't pollinate well unless you have two different varieties or more. Yes. So it's the question, if you don't get pollinated, then you, or cross-pollinated rather, then you don't get as many berries. If I have some existing yeah. little bits of bushes, how do I determine the different varieties? How would I know? Ask them their names. Yeah. <laughs> I, do, I do listen. I do listen to them. <laughs> yeah. Um, again, if you get the soil pH right and you're and you're not getting enough berries, then get another variety or two. When you buy them, it'll have a tag that'll say uh, Blue Boy or uh, the name of it. If you leave that tag there, that'll help you later on. Okay, let's look at some flowers that uh, provide bird food. Sunflowers are wonderful. They're easy to grow. Chipmunks love them. <laughs> chipmunks are a problem. This year in particular, the chipmunks are just everywhere. Are you having that down here? Yes. Yeah. We feed them all, so that's all right. They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, not if they're eating my sunflower. Seedlings, you know, I want to wait until I've got a big sunflower plant, then that's for the birds. We put out a tray of sunflower seeds. They put 500 in their mouth and they run out. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you a funny story about gray squirrels. Um, Usually I just have one gray squirrel or two during the winter that come to my bird feeder. But last year I had seven and they were, they were bothering the birds and keeping the birds out of the bird feeder. So I finally said to them, guys, look, I'm going to get out of my, have a heart trap. I'm going to catch you and send you away unless you behave. I said, I'm going to hang one feeder down below the house, away from my house where all the birds feed. And that's going to be for you guys, you squirrels because I could see them coming down the hill across the stream, running up the lawn and coming up to the house. So I said, I'm gonna intercept them. So I put one there and I also had collected a five gallon pail of acorns in the fall because there was a fellow who rehabilitates bears and baby bears up in Lyme, New Hampshire. And I had collected a whole pickup truck full of acorns um, from friends, neighbors or whatnot. I had a thing. In, in town to everybody bring your acorns and I'll bring them to the bear guy. But I, I, somebody delivered one pail after I'd already delivered them. I kept them thinking, well, I'll feed it to the squirrels. So I put every two days, I put a, a little serving of acorns down there and I have one feeder and those seven squirrels fed there all winter. And I, I didn't know if they'd be a problem when I stopped feeding them, if they'd be eating my plants. They all disappeared. I haven't seen them since. It was like, oh, okay, he was good to us. Now we're gonna go have our lead our lives. So they will next next fall, and that's okay. I'll I'll get some acorns for them, and and it was kind of fun. I enjoyed watching the squirrels. They squabble a lot. Squirrels are not polite to each other. Yeah. 
So black-eyed Susans, you probably grow in your garden. They're all kinds. That one on the left is uh, one I really like. It's called Prairie Sun. And it has a green eye instead of a brown eye, like the ones you see on the right. Prairie Sun, I it's in principle, it's a perennial, but I find it mostly dies in the winter, but I don't care. I buy it again and again because it starts blooming midsummer and it blooms right through October. It's a fabulous prairie sun. Purple coneflower, that's another great one for, for um, all kinds of uh, insects. And in the, in the winter, if you don't cut them back, uh, the finches will come and eat the seeds. I find that I have the best luck with the purple ones. They've come out with orange and yellow and white purple coneflowers, echinacea. Um, but I don't find they're as hardy. I think you're maybe a little warmer here, closer to the seacoast than I am. I'm a zone four. What are you here? Are you a four? Or a... Okay. Then it's probably the same thing. I like the old fashioned purple coneflower and they seem to do well for me. Bee bomb. There's a bumblebee in, in that picture. So uh, talking again about the woody plants used by birds, we, we looked at the slides of the white pine, grapes, cherries of all kinds, crab apples. And um, if you want a, uh, a cardinal or a Baltimore Oriole to nest, uh, and even hummingbirds will, will, uh, will nest in crab apples, and then brambles of all sorts. Okay, here's some great flowers that attract and feed butterflies and native pollinators. This is Angelica. It's a biennial, which means that in the first year, it just has leaves. In the second year, it blooms. Then it doesn't come back after that. That flower you see is about as big as this, and it's, in late, it's a late summer thing. And I'll sometimes, uh, you see there are two, two bumblebees on that one. I've gotten three or four, but never when my camera was ready. You took that picture there? Oh, yeah, I've taken all these pictures. Yeah, and they're, uh, so far, everything's been in my garden. So New England asters are wonderful for producing food for butterflies. Now, think about the monarchs. They're going to fly to Mexico in the fall, a lot of them. You know that if you're going on a long bike race or something, people say, well, have a big meal of carbohydrates the night before. We've got to feed those monarchs lots of calories if they're going to fly all the way to Mexico. So they need nectar, they need pollen. We know that the monarch needs milkweed in order to uh, have their babies, their, their caterpillars to, uh, and their young uh, feed on the leaves, but they also need food for the adults before they do the big flight. So here's some milkweeds, the wild milkweed. Uh, it's pretty aggressive in the garden and most of us don't really want milkweeds taking over our flower beds, right? And they'll do that because their roots go chuk, 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 chuk. Can, can you transplant that? That's what's happening in mine and I, I wanna put the butterflies, milkweeds. but they're taller than my Right, okay, so I'm gonna talk about that because they have root, they don't transplant well. You dig them up, the smaller they are, the better. So recognize the leaf and do it when it first comes up and use a shovel to, to loosen up the soil around it before you lift it up. And they will wilt and act unhappy, but they will probably survive. But there are other milkweeds that are much more well-behaved. You can. You can, yeah. Um, I actually created a flower bed just for, two flower beds just for milkweeds. I've got two to three acres. So I can have, that's what you told me. Yeah, that's great. Restricted to just that box or that garden bed that you have. Well, I, I tend to keep them there. And if they, I tend to pull them out of my, my regular flower beds where I've got peonies and cat mint and, and um, other things because they, they, they can be pushy. But this one's a nice one, this orange one, Asclepias tuberosa or butterfly milkweed is readily available at garden centers. 
But this one, the swamp milkweed, which I also buy at my garden center, um, is less commonly sold, but is a fabulous plant. They have this pink color and a white color. Looking right at you. And uh, it makes a nice plant about this big around and about the yay tall. So look for it. Look for swamp milkweed. That's Asclepius incarnata. All right, I'm going to go through a few things from A to Z, basically. Um, here's a, an annual flower you can get at your garden center uh, as white or purple, alyssum. Bee balm we've already talked about. Calendula is a great plant. One of the things I like about calendula, even though it's an annual, it throws seeds on the ground and it comes back on its own. Um, Thomas Jefferson apparently was very fond of this plant. Cosmos. Yes, don't fertilize it. Cosmos, if you give it far fertilizer, zinnia is the same way. They'll be, you'll get these big, tall plants. But you, well, you would get flowers if you waited long enough. You know, it's just that they put off flowering if they've got lots of fertilizer. <laughs> I love dandelions. How many of you dig dandelions out? <laughs> Try to get rid of them. Well, you know, yes. Um, you know, the thing is, if, if we called them daffodils and, and, we, and they would rebloom and they would come up on their own in your lawn, you would love them. But because we call them dandelions, somehow somebody in the trade that sells grass seed has decided <laughs> that dandelions are pests. And yes, they do get into the flower bed sometimes, but um, Aren't they one of the first early sources of uh, food for the bees? And the birds? Absolutely. And yep. The and stuff. Yeah. Yep. And that's important. We need to have flowers for as many months of the year as we can. Chickweed is another small weed with white flowers that um, is very early, even before the dandelions. I'll, I'll have chickweed blooming. And um, yes, later on, if it gets in with my carrots, I'll pull chickweed out. It's a prolific seeder, makes lots of seeds. But um, these, these plants that we call weeds are just growing in the wrong place. And somehow we've got an attitude about them. So change your attitude. <laughs> these are not, this is not a picture of my garden. This is uh, O'Lally Daylily Company down in Southern Vermont. But um, Daylilies are fabulous. They're all kinds. Here's one that's what they call a spider daylily. Stella Doro, you may know mm -hmm. because it blooms and reblooms off and on all summer. It'll have a bunch of flowers and it'll go dormant for a little while and it'll do it again. Uh, Delphinium are nice, but they're very, uh, they take a lot of work. You've got to stake each tall blossom. These, these, this is not my garden. This is Cider Hill Gardens in Windsor, Vermont. And if you look carefully, you might be able to see, but there's a bamboo stake next to each one of those and it's been tied on. Otherwise it rains or even just a high wind and they blow over. It's a great cut flower. Pinks or dianthus, lovely flowers. They're bright, easy to grow. Fennel, which, uh, or uh, fennel and dill are both attractive to certain uh, butterflies that that, that really depend on them and, and some wild carrots, Queen Anne's lace. Uh, but fennel is a good one to start from seed if you want to have, uh, and I think it's the swallowtail, but I'm not sure. This is one that's, feverfew is um, again, a plant, it's a perennial plant, short-lived. It bounces around everywhere. That's my property there. Uh, and I did not plant any of that. I've got one clump at the edge of my tomato patch that's this big around and this tall right now in full bloom. Forget-me-nots. I love forget-me-nots. Again, they're early. Uh, they're mainly blue, but I have some pink ones. Well, I'm not sure if they're perennial. I think they're annuals or, or biennials. Um, I pull them up like crazy right now because they've already bloomed and I don't worry about them coming back because they drop so many seeds, they're going to be back. Globe thistle uh, is not really a prickly thistle like the kind that uh, hurt your feet when you step on them in the lawn. Good for birds. 
Decorative grasses of all types are, are good. They're attractive. Uh, I have one that stands up about this tall and it stands up all winter. It's called morning light. It's a uh, miscanthus is the, is the Latin name, miscanthus sinensis morning light. Very pretty plant. Okay, here's the number one good plant uh, for pollinators. First of all, let me just say that goldenrod does not cause hay fever. It has a very heavy pollen and it is, one of the reasons it's bright colored is to attract pollinators. But it blooms at the same time as ragweed and ragweed is what causes hay fever. So people have blamed it for that, but it's not. Uh, it's very invasive. There are 28 different kinds of uh, goldenrods growing in New Hampshire. I think it's on its <laughs> Well, that's good. That's good for pollinators. But I have, uh, for example, I have a short one, this tall, that grows in dry shade. And it's very, you know, it stays in a nice little clump. I wish it would spread a little bit. I bought it. Yes, I bought gold. I buy golden rods. Um, this one that I mentioned here, fireworks, if you ever see it, it gets to be about, oh, this big. I've got a, a clump of it right now that's this big. It, it took me five years to get it to be that big. But this, it goes out like fireworks. And, and it's just, when it's in full bloom, people just like, wow, what is that? And I'll say, it's golden rod. And they'll say, oh, no, you're growing golden rod. Yeah. <laughs> But it's, it really is a terrific plant. So again, it's about attitude change. Sneezeweed, <laughs> it, it blooms in the fall. It likes a moist place, doesn't like real dry places, um, but it does not make you sneeze. Back in the 1700s, people used to take the flowers, grind them up and use them for snuff. Back in the day when they put things up their nose to make them sneeze. But you can see it comes in different colors and it's a terrific plant. Hollyhocks are wonderful. They come in all different kinds of colors. Some are biennials, which means that they bloom the second year and then die. Uh, most of mine are perennial hollyhocks with short lives. But uh, those red ones on the right are some that I've had a clump for 10 years. And they, the same root systems setting them up. In general, with biennials, and that includes foxgloves, hollyhocks and some other plants if you cut them back after they bloom they're more likely to come back the next year in other words they don't put a lot of extra energy into making seeds but they do come back from the roots no guarantee don't sue me if, if yours don't but <laughs> try it lavender is beautiful but i can't overwinter it it takes fast drained soil sandy soil which i don't have and it needs a fairly high pH neutral or slightly above, which I could produce, but it's, my soil is too rich really for lavender. It wants to be growing in the Mediterranean. Did anybody here have luck with lavender coming back year two? It's tough to grow, but I grow it as an annual sometimes because it's so pretty and it smells so good. Gay feather, oleatris. Uh, you see that picture on the right. Um, on the left is a picture I took for some at one of my clients houses where they had some bad weeds and they put down black plastic and, and bark mulch, no soil. And this liatris started growing there on its own. So it, 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 you see that it doesn't really need very much for growing conditions, but it likes it hot and dry. Marigolds, you know, and again, it's something that the, the bees are gonna be attracted to. It's very fragrant. Nasturtiums, we all know and love. Okay, going through all this. Oregano your... has flowers after it, uh, after midsummer, and it becomes less tasty. It gets a little bitter for use in the kitchen, but um, insect pollinators love it. I put pansies out early in the spring. I buy pansies as early as I can find them and put them in a pot on the front steps. Why not? Yeah, um, phlox is, is a, a plant that often has mildew or mold on the leaves that can be very unsightly, but plant growers have 
develop by breeding, not from genetically modifying things, but from breeding varieties that don't get mildewy as easily. So the one on the right is called David, nice white one, which is said to be mildew resistant. When my clump of David gets to be this big, because it does get bigger and bigger each year, it gets covered with mildew because there's not enough air blowing through it. Um, the other thing that will happen if you plant them in, a, in an area that has afternoon shade, it should be okay, but in fact, you're more likely to get mildew. You want them to go to bed with dry leaves. So you never water the plants in the evening. And if you have afternoon sunshine, they'll go to bed with dry leaves and, and it'll be less likely to have a problem. It does spread. Well, that's because you're always digging it up and moving it around. I love that picture on the right of the bee on the purple cone flower. We talked about that already. Queen Anne's lace is a weed. In some people's uh, imagination, to me, Queen Anne's lace is one of the most beautiful flowers I can grow. It's a biennial. So it's, you know, I can't, I can't buy them usually. Sometimes you will find in a, at a good uh, garden center, something called Daucus carota, D-A-U-C-U-S, and then it looks like carrot with an A on the end. That is a Queen Anne's lace. And if you see it, you can sometimes get it in white and purple. I've, I've had purple Queen Anne's lace, but after it blooms, then that year, you know, it's supposed to self sow. And, and if you put, put it in, in a, an edge of your property where it's not in a, in, a, in, a, in a fancy flower bed and just let the seeds drop and don't pull them out the next year, you've got to recognize the very fine foliage and, and let them grow. But I, I have not had good luck with having it. How do they transplant? It's, a, it's got a tap root. It's in the carrot family. So you can transplant them, but it's difficult. Do it early in the season. Get to know what the leaves look like. And, and they look like carrot leaves, essentially. And it's a wild carrot. It's not like the flower before it blooms. It does. That one looks like a... Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. 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 Uh, sage right now is blooming for me and, and is loved by the bees. Scabiosa likes it hot and dry. It's a nice plant. Again, it's a perennial, but I don't find that it's long lived. I tend to kill it on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Shasta daisies come on all, all different kinds from that fluffy one on the right to the standard one on the left. And then you have your wild ones, which are much less impressive, but I leave them. When they pop up in a flower bed, I say, oh, thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Yeah. 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 Uh, sedums are nice. They're all different kinds. Uh, bugs love them. Mm -hmm. You probably know Sedum Autumn Joy. That's one of the last flowers to bloom in the fall. And again, we need things for our pollinators that are blooming in every month of the year that we possibly can. So my first flower is the, is the um, snowdrop. And uh, I normally bring in on March 4th. Uh, a few little cut snowdrops. They're not open yet, but I put them in a little tiny. I don't know if some of you are old enough to remember when you went to a restaurant and got coffee, they used to have a little glass jar with cream in it. Well, um, and, and um, I use that. I have a couple of those and I put the snowdrops in there. I put them next to a, a desk lamp and they'll open up. They're fun. So until November, Certainly through Halloween, I've got lots of stuff still blooming. Uh, those prairie sun uh, rudbeckias. I have a monk's hood that blooms in November. And a few other things. Um, I have one rose, which continues to bloom right up to Halloween. And that's, um, it's surprising, but you know, it's, it's one that just keeps blooming and reblooming. Um, I love this uh, uh, verbena monariensis or Brazilian verbena. It's about three to four feet tall. If you look at the picture on the left, you can see how much space there is between the, the, the leaves, which are very understated. And it does, it's not something that usually needs to be staked. It's, it's pretty sturdy. 
Yarrow comes in lots of different colors. And finally, we get to Z for zinnia. Um, zinnias hate to have their roots disturbed. Well, if you buy a six pack of zinnias, you know, if, if you take them out and you see the roots are all in a clump and you want to just take your fingers and loosen up, don't do it. Zinnias hate that. So be, be very gentle with your zinnias. The Profusion series is very short, four to six inches. They're lovely. And um, other varieties are three to four feet tall. Mm -hmm. You can collect seeds on most um, zinnias and just throw them. I, a lot of times I'll prepare a bed the size of the table over here and I'll just rake up the soil, you know, free of weeds. And I'll just take a handful of zinnia seeds that I've collected from the year before, then take the rake, and, the lawn rake upside down, drag it through, pat it down, and I'll get 150 zinnias that will grow there. <laughs> <laughs> you can do this. I had it many years, one year, so many years ago with my neighbor. I came home one day and he had cut all the flowers without my consent or permission. And I was a rookie then, so I really didn't understand. Had him on his table upstairs. I got very upset. And I, I don't have her any uh, vengeance or anything like that. And I have a handy lock with him ever since. Uh, so I'm, not, I'm wondering why. Don't you think the more flowers you cut, the more you get? Oftentimes, yeah. yeah. But it depends on the type, time of year, too. If it's in the fall, you're not going to get any more. Okay, um, here's a nice vine fall bloom, blooming clematis. If you look at that, that's taller than I am. And that all that white up there are clematis blossoms. Is that a perennial or annual? That's a perennial. It is. Okay. Yeah, and that's, that's paniculata. That's the, the species name of that one. Um, it's supposed to be fragrant but that one wasn't fragrant. So if you, if you want a fragrant clematis, buy this one in the, in the fall at the garden center and smell it. So you see whether you get a fragrant one or not. How many acres do you have? How big is your yard? Um, I have just two or three acres. I, I love this little um, uh, Daph, February Daphne. Uh, I actually named my last dog, uh, the, my Corgi who passed away last summer. Um, Feb, uh, Daphne Miserium. That was her full name. It, it blooms in, you know, it's February in New Jersey. It's not February here. It blooms here in April. <laughs> you have another dog now? So? Not yet. I'm still waiting for a dog. Another shelter with your name on it. I hope so. I, there is. I know so. Yeah. So witch hazel is a, is a native uh, tree or shrub. It gets to be about 15 or 20 feet tall. It blooms in the fall. There are some that bloom in the spring as well. The one on the right is not mine. That is a spring bloomer. The one on the left is mine. The, I, I had witch hazel for a while before I knew that it bloomed in the fall because the leaves are yellow. And it's only after the leaves drop that you get to see the blossom. There's my Merrill Magnolia. It blooms reliably on April 23rd, which is my birthday with a thousand white blossoms from that tree. That was taken a few years ago, it's bigger now. And um, you see on the right how big that is, and it's, it's lightly fragrant, it's a wonderful plant. I recommend it as a, as a specimen tree. In other words, if you have a big lawn, plant a big tree in it and let it have its day in the sun, let it be, rather than putting it in the, you know, all your trees off to the edges. The fellow that wrote that, that entomologist that wrote uh, Nature's Best Hope that tells all about the relationship between insects and birds and how important having plant diversity is. Um, he said, let consider lawn like area rugs instead of wall to wall carpeting. <laughs> you know, we, we do lawn and as wall to wall carpeting, but instead plant lots of little gardens, break up that lawn, think about what you can do, make a plan. If you want to help the environment, you want to help the birds, you want to help the bees, you've got to have a plan. And, and you, I think one of the best things you can do is to reduce the size of your lawn. Plant some of the things you see today, particularly the trees and shrubs. And don't be as afraid of planting big trees like oaks. Oak trees drop acorns that grow. And in the spring, if you know what an, what an 
oak leaf looks like, they're very easy to transplant. They're this tall and you just tug on it and you'll see the, the acorn is still there and then you'll see a root about three or four inches. Put that somewhere and let it grow. Pussy willows are great. They're early. That's actually, if you look on the right there, that's pollen, that yellow on the, on the bud. But if you want in the house to keep pussy willows looking good for weeks and weeks, don't put them in a vase with water, put them in a dry vase and they won't get to the pollen stage and let put pollen all over your tablecloth. Mm -hmm. Apples and crab apples we talked about, they're terrific for the bees. That's my barn on the left, climbing hydrangea, which is in bloom right now. It's a slow growing plant at first, but once it gets established, it, it does very well. It will attach itself to, to stone or brick, but not to wood. So if, on my barn there, I had to make attachments with um, little plastic straps at first, and then it grew in between the boards. It's just uh, boards that are together. And as they shrink up a little bit, the hydrangea would go through. I've actually had that climbing hydrangea blooming inside my barn. <laughs> I don't know why it is that way, but that's the way it is. You just have to accept it. And uh, so on, on the right, that's pink diamond. It's another nice hydrangea. It's like the PG hydrangea that you all know and love, but pink diamond, I think is one of the best because it has such good, strong stems. A lot of the other hydrangeas flop when they get these uh, rainstorm and the, they have these big, heavy panicles. The blossoms are so big that they go and they'll even break. Annabelle is a, is a low one that, again, has huge uh, blossoms, but they, you can't keep them up. We talked about blueberries. Now, um, I have over here, somewhere over there, there's a paper. If you want to um, get my newspaper clippings every week, you just sign up with your email and every Sunday you'll get my article along with three photos. And there's no charge for that. So let me answer your questions. What would you like to, and you've been asking questions as we went along, but what else would you like to, to ask me about? It doesn't have to be specifically bird or bee related, but anything gardening is, is my passion. Yes. Why did squirrels go into my new yellow magnolia and just eat like the inside but drop the flowers? They ate like the inside of where the flower was. They were looking for something good to eat, and I'm not sure. Yes, I think they were going for the seeds. Again, seeds are high in oil. Yeah. So, um, and every situation is different. But that yellow magnolia is a nice magnolia and you really don't want the squirrels. I've had red squirrels this year going on my willow, my dragon tail willow and, and chewing the bark off. And then the, the yellow bellied sapsucker comes along and, and, and starts working on it. So they really beat up my poor willow. But you know, it, it's frustrating. It is. You know, because I had just put it in. And when I saw the squirrel out on or the railing, I said, what do you want to know? Because Two days prior, he had gotten a couple other bosses. So I said, let me run out before he gets it. Yeah. So well, I like repellents. And um, for deer, for example, I, I've always had dogs up until this last year. And so I haven't had, and there's plenty of browse where I live. But um, now that Daphne's gone, I have to be a little bit more vigilant with the, uh, with the deer. And I found something that's... Uh, it's a garlic spike. It's it's uh, it's a repellent that has. It looks like it's about it's green. It's this long, and inside there is garlic oil. And it comes with a little tool. You you poke in there and break the aluminum foil cap, and you clip it on like a clothespin onto a onto a branch. And deer just hate it. And it says it's good for rabbits as well. I don't know about putting some in your magnolia, but you might want to give it a try. Maybe on a couple of bosses. Yeah. Well, I mean, just on the tree, just make it smell like garlic. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I've tried that. I've used those garlic I call them clips yeah. for 10, 20 years. Yeah. Uh, you can get them from Gardner Supply. That's right. About a dollar a piece. Right? Yeah. 
it's worth it. They last about six months. So, That's right. And I have put them on magnolias over the winter. I just need to get out before the snow comes so I can get to my yeah. trees and shrubs. I put them on the pear and the crab apple. Yeah, yeah they're very the, good. The, uh, I put one on a stick next to the hosta that the deer particularly like. Mm -hmm. That seems to work. Good. Uh, yeah, well, it's, it's always good to hear somebody, somebody that agrees with me. <laughs> Yes, sir. Perfect. Young lady in the front first. Okay. I have a few in my drainage tree. Yeah. Drainage tree. And the squirrels are under the same thing. They ate right at the base, like the bark. So I bought some of that wrap. Yeah, so good. Will that come back? And then I didn't take the wrap off. I, I would take, take the wrap off now for the summer. Uh huh. Um, because you can get insects under it and you can get um, fungus under it. So you don't want to have the uh, the wrap on all summer, but then wrap it again in the winter. Does bark go back? Not really. Okay, so I no. If it's doing fine, it's probably going to be fine, but we don't really know. If the cambium is, which is the the green layer underneath the bark, if that got removed all the way around, your tree is going to die because it can't feed the roots. Um, I had a an espalier um, apple tree, one that has branches going this way on a wall. And um, if the base was this big around and I'd never had any problem, but this winter, some little rodents got there and they chewed all the bark off all the way around. However, the tree look, is doing great right now. It blossomed, it's got full of leaves, it's new, got new growth. So I think they just took the bark off and not, didn't kill, didn't get the cambium. I'm, I'm keeping my fingers crossed until next year. Yes, sir. May I share a little story? Sure. I'm a Franciscan and I volunteered about thousands of hours at shelters here in New Hampshire. And I learned that the animals are all one unit and they all work together and they all know each other. So when you see one animal, you see all the animals there, the equal, the insects, the fish, even extinct ones. So I've learned in my own yard that if I don't welcome, embrace, and respect all the creatures, that I really welcome and embrace none of the creatures. So I had a dog at one point that had fleas and ticks. And if I say I love the dog, and then I poison the fleas and the ticks, then I don't really love the dog. And it's a tough lesson. It's very difficult to absorb that and understand that. And, you know, so we feed critters that a lot of people consider vermin or not welcome critters. And no wires that are getting chewed. We're not swollen enough to help freeze. We're not mossy, not sweater. We don't have the antsy now. What? Because they know the problem and they're all embraced and they work together. We don't have poison. We don't have discoveries here at the monastery. Just my wife and myself, a third order. And it's a tough lesson for a lot of us. And I see people that sort of buying poison for the swirls, for the center. And they have, they're just trying to ask you a question. And I just kind of share because I, I find it, it's more welcoming and it's more embracing and it's a better feeling than to try to discourage and control and push certain creatures away because they're harming other creatures when they're just trying to teach me what I just shared. That's yeah. my personal experience. And a lot of us don't like that story yet. You know? I, I like, like the story, story and we all have to figure out the balance. But you know, part of being an organic gardener is not putting sprays to kill the Japanese beetles and whatnot. I don't have trouble with Japanese beetles on my roses. I don't spray them either. So maybe I'm just, without having your particular philosophy, I've been living it. And um, you know, when you, when you, when you spray a, an herbicide like Roundup or uh, something like Seven to kill insects, you're also killing things in the soil. Your soil bacteria and fungi, they're so important for root health and for plant health. Your soil is really the key to the to being a good gardener is to have good soil. Yes. I inherited some peonies and I planted them about four years ago, like three or four bushes. And so they looked fabulous, right? But no blooms. And That's an easy fix. I planted them too deep. I yes, you did. So I replanted them, but only this deep. That's still pretty deep. Really? Yeah. Uh, no more than two inches from from the, we, we get your fingers in the fall, feel for those little nubs, those little pointy things in the soil. If they're more than two inches deep, they're not going to bloom. You'll have beautiful leaves. Oh, I but, have beautiful leaves. Right, but you're not going to get blossoms. I know. So what you can do is just pull, you don't have to replant them. Just pull the soil away and the mulch away 
and, and have a little well there perhaps, and just have those things closer to the surface. Oh, Some people say even three quarters of an inch to an inch for the, for the nubs or the, the growing mm -hmm. points of your peonies to be below the ground. But even if you put too much mulch on your peonies, you may find that you've got a reduction in blossom. And they don't like to share. They like to have clean nuts. They don't like other nuts. They, they like to have some space, yeah. When is the best time um, to split, like, say, a To split on, to divide a peony? Yeah. October. October, okay. October 10th at 9 a.m. <laughs> no, I have a friend that I told I have part of my, my children, have <laughs> If you've got the money. homemade donuts. <laughs> yes. So can you um, can you buy a plant of plant? Yes. Yeah. Go to your local garden center, particularly in the springtime, and you and they have they'll have two or three different kinds of pussy willows. They'll have a standard pussy willow, they may have a pink pussy willow, and they may have a black pussy willow. But there are there are 25 or 30 different pussy willows that will grow in New Hampshire. Speed different species or varieties. But don't put it near a septic tank or a well or something. Yeah, you yeah, yeah that it's the, against the water in Massachusetts. You can't buy them. Huh. Yeah. Yes. So you had talked about like fennel and like nasturtium and other like some of weird sort of like edible like plants and things like that. Is there anything to be said about like your zucchinis and like pumpkins and things like that that will have a large flower, but then you kind of have a trade off with things that you can also eat? Like, is there, do you have anything on that or? Well, it's not something I've thought about a lot. I mean, I grow all the vegetables from artichoke to zucchini. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't grow artichokes every year, but I do them occasionally. They're fun. So the, when, the, when they're in bloom, they're great for the pollinators. They're, they're getting pollen, they're getting nectar. And then later on, we'll get the pumpkin or we'll get the squash. So it's a win-win situation. And you'll notice that on a lot of your squashes, you'll have a lot of blossoms early on and they don't produce any squashes. Those are the males. You have male and female flowers on squashes. The males come first and later on the females come and they get together. How do you fix they start to grow and they rot right there? The zucchinis, they get them and they grow and then all of a sudden they're gone and they start to rot. How do I fix that? I don't know. <laughs> so um just again a reminder my book is for sale over here at 17 dollars. i'll be glad to sign your copy for you and um i've enjoyed talking to you and getting to know a little bit about uh your gardens and thank you for showing up and we'll see you again <laughs> so much for coming to today's program. We do have a full summer reading program for you all to enjoy. Um, there is a full calendar of events on our website. There's also mm -hmm. events posted on our Facebook if you are on Facebook. And last but not least, there are paper copies downstairs and upstairs. Um, if you wanted to sign up for summer reading, we do have some several options for you. We have the online version that you just take the paper home. I can also open up a computer for you right in the children's room that we can um, one, two, three, sign you up or little fashion pen and paper. Super easy. You read a book, you write it down, you write the next book up to three on the page. And today's program, the secret code is bees. And that's it. You get your, your four raffles if you're including the program. You turn it in, we give you a new one. Voila. Okay, so thank you so much and I hope you all have a great evening. Thank you.